got something different for us today. Uh, this year, over the course of the year, I've, I've, I've been reading through uh, this, this amazing uh, book uh, by Wayne Grudem entitled Christian Ethics. And uh, this is my, my second time through the book. I still think it's, it's just really excellent, would commend it to you. Um, but one of the things that stuck out to me this time was the way in which he handled questions relating to science or nature and technology, matters like that. And, and what was helpful is this a real basic biblical framework. That, that, that the author kept going back to in, in answering these different questions that we naturally wonder about in that area. I, I, think, I think science and, and nature is, is, a, is an area where Christians tend to struggle. And um, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe you view science as, as sort of enemy territory, like, like that's kind of bad, that's kind of scary, that's kind of worldly or whatever. Uh, that's something to be, to, to kind of edge away from. Uh, and, and maybe we feel that way because of certain topics, you know, so you've got, you got evolution or abortion or euthanasia or, or certain medical ethics issues, you know, like human cloning or whatever. You say, well, that, not sure about that. And uh, maybe that's bad. And, and so we tend to react against some of those things. And then, then the pendulum ends up over at the other side. And, and you, have, you, 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 have, you have some Christians that, that are, seem skeptical of all science. And, and, uh, and, and, and of course, the, I mean, those, the whole virus business that we've been through has really exposed differences in how, in how Christians approach questions of science and medicine and, and so on. Um, I, I think some of us Christians are kind of attracted to an Amish-type lifestyle. Um, you know, I mean, wouldn't we be more holy if we didn't have electricity and we didn't have cars and we didn't have indoor plumbing and, you know, we, we could flee, we could flee the, 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 the dirty, evil, materialistic cities and get out there in God's country in pristine nature and we could homestead with some, I don't know, some goats and chickens or something. Some people think that way. We struggle, too, with environmental issues. Uh, I mean, how much should we care about pollution and renewable energy and climate change? Some Christians kind of scoff at all that stuff. Other Christians think it's a big deal. How do we process questions like that? Well, my purpose today is not to give you my opinion on any of those specific topics, but to give you something a lot better, which is a, a biblical grid, a biblical framework, biblical principles through which you can think through all those different questions for yourself and arrive at, at wise answers. Um, how do we approach questions about the natural world, scientific inquiry, and, and technological development? I, for me, this has been just kind of freeing and refreshing um, and uh, just to be reminded of, of five really basic, clear truths of Scripture that relate to uh, those questions. And, and conveniently, they could all be found in the first three chapters of Genesis. Uh, if you'd like to turn back there in your Bibles. Five, five principles to help us think biblically about nature, science, and technology. So principle number one is that God's original creation was very good. Very good. Uh, so, so that's found right here in the first chapter of Genesis. Uh, those wrinkly pages at the front of your Bible. Genesis chapter 1, it describes the six days of creation. How God created the universe and along the way, keeps emphasizing the goodness of that creation. And so on day one, verse three, um, talking about the light, uh, God says, let there be light. There was light. God saw that the light was good. And so it particularly points to the goodness of the light. And then day three in verse 10, it says, God called the dry land earth, the gathering of the waters he caused seas, and God saw that it was good. Then verse 12, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was 
good. Day four, about the celestial lights in the sky. Uh, It says to, to govern the day and the night, to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Day 5, verse 21, he talks about the the creatures in the sea and the the winged birds and then says God saw that it was good. Day 6, in verse 25, this is is the animals. God made beasts of the earth after their kind, cattle after their kind, everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. And then the end of the whole process in verse 31 says God saw all that he had made And behold, it was very good. God the Creator, as He goes along, He keeps looking at each part of His creation and saying, that's good, and that's good, and that's good, and that's good. And then He gets all done and He looks at the whole thing together and says the whole thing is very good. God's creation was good. It was was perfect, I would say. Uh, The natural world started out Perfect, a place of beauty, a place of abundance with no diseases and no problems. Everything on earth uniquely designed by God, everything fine tuned for its purpose, which is to support this, this massive variety of life that we have on earth. And the, and the earth was especially made for us humans. We are the crowning completion of God's creative work. We are the ones, uh, according to verse 26 and 27, who are made in God's image. That means we are those that have special capacities that the animals and the insects and the fish do not have. We have capacity to know God, to have a relationship with God, uh, and to be like God in, in many ways. I'll, I'll read it, verse 26 of Genesis 1. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then verse 27, God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. See, God intended the earth to support a vast human population. Do you think of it that way? Yeah, uh, because the next verse, verse 28, says he tells these, the man, Adam and Eve there at the beginning, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He wants the earth packed full of people. That was God's design from the beginning. Uh, and, and, and after the flood, in the time of Noah, God repeats this to Noah. So it's not, it's not something that's changed. He tells Noah, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then there's an important verse on this over in Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, verse 18. I'll just read it to you. But it's one you want to be familiar with. It, it says, I'll just quote out of the middle of the verse. It says, He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but He formed it to be inhabited. He formed the earth to be inhabited. His purpose in making the earth was that lots of people could live here. And, and, and God made this world with such abundance of resources and such reserves of energy that right now we're supporting almost 8 billion people on this planet. It's, it's an amazing testament to the goodness of God's creation, to the amazing design that God has uh, as, as put in to this, this earth. So that's the first principle. Creation, at the beginning, was very good. On to principle number two. That is that people should exercise dominion over this creation. People are supposed to be in charge of the natural world. And we see this also in Genesis chapter 1. If you look back at verse 26, Genesis 1, 26, uh, we read the first part a minute ago. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. But then he continues on. And let them rule over, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth. 
We're to be ruling over all the critters and all the earth, it says, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the earth and subdue the earth. And that, that word subdue is a strong Hebrew word. It's, it's a word for, for, taking, for bringing some, somebody into bondage, for like making somebody your slave, where you, you like completely control everything. About it. And that's the word God uses for controlling the earth, subduing the earth. God said that's what God wanted. And then, then he says it again, and rule over. I think the ESV says have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So it's just, God says it several different ways. We're supposed to be in charge of things here. Humanity is supposed to be taking dominion. And, and, and the interesting thing here is the context that, as, as, as we mentioned a minute ago, verse 26 and 27, those are the verses that talk about, about humans being made in the image of God, right? And so right alongside being made in God's image is having control over nature. I think those, those two thoughts are, are connected in God's mind. It's, it's because we're made in God's image that God wants us to act kind of like him on this earth that we as humans we have the the capacity to to exercise a degree of sovereignty a degree of creativity a, a degree of problem solving wisdom here in this earth and that's the way God wants it it's glorifying to him it's displaying his image he wants people to be the lords of his creation in a sense, he wants us to be in charge like that. And, and, and you see this, this starting uh, right in the next chapter in Genesis 2. Now, this is before the fall. This is before any sin happens. And, and, and God does immediately speaks to Adam about Adam's work. So in Genesis 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. So the Garden of Eden, it starts out already very good, right? It was perfect. It, but God didn't want it to stay wild. God wanted that garden to be cared for by human hands. He wanted Adam to get in there and improve things. Figure out how to make it work better for people. To yield more produce or, or whatever Adam was supposed to do there to, to develop that garden. And that same principle is true of the whole earth. He wants people all over the whole earth subduing and ruling over it, developing it for the good of humanity. And this, this concept was reaffirmed after uh, the flood with Noah in Genesis chapter 9. I'll just read a couple verses there. Genesis 9 verse 2, it says, The fear of you, the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth. And every bird of the sky, everything that creeps on the ground, all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. So, so it kind of reaffirms this whole idea to Noah. Nope, this is still true. Noah and your family, you guys are supposed to take dominion. You're supposed to rule over this earth. I'm putting it in your hands. You're supposed to be in charge. And then, then, then King David sings about this in an amazing way in Psalm 8, in the 8th Psalm. And this is worth turning to, um, uh, Psalm 8. I'll read, read you some verses out of the middle of that psalm. Psalm 8, and uh, you know, it starts out just looking at the majesty of, of, of creation. And, and then so Psalm 8, verse 3 says, When I consider your heavens... The work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you take thought of him? And the son of man that you care for him? And oh, we seem so small compared to the stars, right? And, and the more you know about the bigness of space out there, the smaller we seem. And so David is, is looking up into the sky and saying, well, what is man? What's... And then he turns in verse 5 and says, Yet, yet you have made him a little lower than God. 
So yours God way up here and man is just a little lower. A little lower. You've made him a little lower than God. And you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him rule over, or, or, or I think the ESV, give dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. So David, David has the same idea. We're the lords of creation. We made, we've been given glory and honor to rule over things. This is our job. God made a universe that can be explored and investigated and experimented on and understood by people. And he's given people the curiosity and the intelligence to be able to do that, and that over time to develop more and more and more and more knowledge of this world that God has made, and we can share that knowledge with each other around the world and across generations, and gradually over time we figure things out. And we're able to exercise more dominion and more control over time, and thereby reflect God's image in us. And God sees this general process of people doing this. And He says it's good. God applauds this. God says, yeah, you guys are doing what you're supposed to do as human beings made in My image. You are ruling over. You are taking dominion over My creation. The, the general, that general pattern, not all the details, but the general pattern is good. It's right. It's pleasing to the Lord. To be using his earth that way. To be, figure out how to take, take a bunch of raw materials and make something a lot more valuable out of it. I mean, take, take sand and oil and, and copper and, and make a smartphone out of it. You know, just, just those, kind of, those kind of amazing things that, that people were able to do. God is not saying, hey, leave it alone. Hey, leave my creation alone. Don't mess with it. Leave it pristine. No, he's saying, no you're, he's saying you're supposed to develop it. It's all there so that you will do things like that. So you will make smartphones. And, and uh, he wants us to figure out new stuff, invent new and better things to improve people's lives. And so, so it should not surprise you then that historically, you go back to the 1600s and the 1700s and the 1800s, the people at the forefront of science, of, of the, the major developments that were happening in our understanding of the world, those people, for the most part, were either Christians themselves or at least had borrowed a Judeo-Christian world view. And it was through that worldview that they, that they explored and took dominion over the earth. In general, the countries and cultures with the most gospel light, the most Bible understanding, are also the places where science and engineering has flourished over the last centuries. And so I, I personally hate it when, when the world, either fairly or unfairly, uh, portrays Christians as being anti Science. We're not. Because we, we wholeheartedly believe principle number two there. That we're supposed to be taking dominion over the earth. And, and we as Christians have done that historically over past centuries. Well on to principle number three. And that is that creation is now badly damaged because of human Sin. First two principles are really positive. God made a perfect world. We're supposed to all be in charge of it. But then things get negative with number three. Creation is now damaged because of human sin. And if you want to go back to Genesis, we can read about it in Genesis chapter 3. Here's Adam and Eve, the first people. They were created upright and perfect, sinless. But they chose to listen to the devil and to sin against God. And just as God warned them, that sin would have big, bad consequences. Far worse consequences than they imagined, I'm sure. And as a result, God's perfect world ended up badly marred. Badly messed up. 
So Genesis 3, verse 16, the, God is talking to them after their sin. And He's addressing Eve in verse 16. To the woman He said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. So, so here is a particular consequence of sin in the realm of human health. So pain, difficulty in childbirth. And then in verse 17, he addresses Adam. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. He says the earth, this earth, this ground is now under a curse because of you, Adam, because of your sin. It's a cursed earth. In toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. Nature is now going to be producing some bad things. It's going to be producing things that make your life harder. Farmers don't have to plant weeds, get weeds in their field. Weeds just happen. <laughs> they're, going to, they're going to be there if you don't do anything. goes on in, in verse 18, You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken. You are dust and to dust you shall return. So now we've got death on the scene. All humans are dying. They're returning to the dust. We are cursed that way with death. And the New Testament then describes this problem rather poetically in, in Romans chapter 8, if you'd like to turn there, you, you definitely need to be familiar with this paragraph. Romans 8 and verse 19, the New Testament says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. He's talking about there, there are a resurrection at the end of the world. It says the creation is excited about our resurrection. For the creation was subjected to futility, says Romans 8 verse 20, subjected to futility. Futility means that there's this frustrating brokenness about the earth now. And it's everywhere. Not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it. So God did this back in Genesis 3, like we just read about in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption. So that's another, another way of describing it, a slavery to corruption. Corruption is about decay and death and things getting worse, things breaking down. It's, the creation is a slave to corruption. But he, he's looking forward to the time when he'll be set free from that into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. He says it's not just Eve that had the pains of childbirth, but all of creation is groaning and is agonizing in this brokenness, this mess that has happened. The damage is not subtle, right? It's, it's not just, there's not just a little bit of discomfort. But no, it's, it's, it's the worst kind of pain humans experience. The pain of, of childbirth says that's the pain that creation is in right now. It's intensely bad. So guys, we're not, we're not living in Eden anymore. You, you may have noticed that. We're not. We're not in a place where everything is very good. We're in a place where there's danger and pain and trouble and disease and death. It just permeates nature. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made, yes, and yet they're also gravely damaged. You know, in, in 2 Corinthians it talks about the, the outer man is perishing. As, as we get older, we feel our bodies are perishing. They're breaking down, they're breaking, they're deteriorating, we're heading toward the grave. And, and, and those of us not in medical fields, don't think much about it, can kind of go blissfully along and, and not really aware of how, of how broken it all is. But, but then certain events really bring it to our attention, you know, certain situations in, in our family or whatever, and, 
we're confronted with just how ruined and cursed the world really is. There's a lot of stuff in this world that is quote unquote natural, but it is not good. Not good anymore. It's been messed up. It's not part of God's original ideal design. I mean, this thorns and thistles business, that's natural, but it's not good. It's, it, it's a hindrance. It's bad for, for farmers. I think you'd say the same thing about mosquitoes and termites and rattlesnakes and tornadoes and wildfires and poison ivy and malaria and birth defects and cancer. All those things are natural now, but they're not good. They're not good. It's part of this messed up. And, and, and the thing is, you still hear people make this naturalness argument, um, you know, about you know, for our organic food or, or against medical treatments or whatever. And it's like, oh, I don't want to put unnatural chemicals in my body. Well, <laughs> I mean, they, they, think, they think they're being pious in that. Really, they're being pagan. Uh, they're speaking from a worldview that idolizes nature rather than seeing nature biblically, which is that it's fallen, it's broken. There's a lot of natural stuff that is not good, and there, there are unnatural things that we can do to combat that, and we should do that. And, and that's the fourth principle that we'll talk about, that people are called to overcome creation's brokenness to whatever extent we can it's our job to push back against the brokenness in in different ways and so if you turn back to Genesis chapter 3 you see that Genesis 3 uh, again God's we'll read God's instructions to Adam here after Adam's sin so Genesis 3 and and I guess picking up in the middle verse 17 God says cursed is the ground because of you in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground See Adam is still lord of Creation. He's still supposed to rule and subdue the earth. He's still in that position. But all of a sudden, his job just got a whole lot harder, didn't it? He's still supposed to make the earth produce. But now the earth isn't going to cooperate like it did before. He's going to have to fight with thorns and thistles and all these other problems that we just talked about. And yet, it's still Adam's job to figure out how to make it work. It's still his job. He's got to figure out how to grow some food or he's going to starve, right? He's got to fight the thorns and thistles. He's got to overcome these results of the fall. How's he going to do it? Just plumb hard work, right? It says by toiling, by the sweat of his brow. It's by, it's by hard effort. He's pushing back the thorns and thistles and trying to grow enough food to keep himself and his family alive. See? And, and God says it's, it's not going to get easy. He's going to spend his whole life doing it. You're going to keep on toiling until, until finally you just die yourself and return turn to the dust. And so that's the, that's the basic process that's still going on today. And, and it's still that we're still called to be engaged in today. Pushing back, seeking to redeem little aspects of the fallenness of the world wherever we can. And a big part of that process is what we call science, technology, engineering, industry. It's the process of overcoming aspects of, of, of the fall. The, and that process is good. God commands that. God wants that to happen. Remember, remember what we said earlier that God made the earth to be inhabited. He wants the, he wants the earth filled with people. Even now in its cursed state, He still wants the earth keep filled with people. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to, have a, a, how are we going to support 8 billion people? On earth. Well, it's going to take some science. It's going to take some engineering. 
to pull that off, isn't it? I think it starts with energy. I mean, God has given just massive energy resources deposited right here on the surface of our planet. And, and, we, and, and there's, still, there's still massive resources there to be used. Why? So that, so that people can fill the earth, so they can survive and flourish. And then I think of agriculture in this regard. I mean, the, the, the changes in agricultural productivity over the last, say, 75 years, say over my dad's lifetime as a farmer, are just, are just unbelievable. You, you guys could talk to, to, to Sam or Frank there all afternoon about, about that stuff. Just you know, crop genetics and, and, and pesticides, fertilizer, irrigation, just new methods and equipment and, and so on. We've gotten just massive productivity gains. We're able to feed 8 billion people. It's amazing. Um, and it's ag science. And then, and then I think I think the third thing we've done is, is, by God's grace, has been on the medical side. You know, how how is it that the that the you know the world's population is not being wiped out with smallpox or or, or the bubonic plague? Uh, well, how do we keep eight billion people reasonably healthy? Well, it's amazing, amazing advances in in pharmaceuticals. I mean, just just basic old antibiotics have have helped help treat so many things and and then and then on to more advanced stuff surgical methods and testing equipment and 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 immunizations have been huge over history in 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 eliminating so many dread diseases that are now easily preventable and so those are just some examples of how we've used the tools of of just science engineering technology to to push back against the thorns and thistles, the brokenness of the, of the world, so that humanity can flourish and multiply and fill the earth as God desires. That all sounds real positive, but I, but I want to acknowledge the bad side of that too. It's not all good news. Not everything that scientists and engineers come up with are good things, are they? Uh, I mean, some stuff is just obviously evil. I mean, drugs that kill unborn babies are, are bad. Uh, governments that use, you know, vast computer networks to spy on Christians and persecute them, that's bad use of technology. And then there's, there's also a lot of stuff where, where people mean well, and the stuff seemed good at first, and then it turns out not to be so good. You know, 75 years ago, asbestos was this miracle material that people wanted to put in everything. And then we figured out, well, it's killing a lot of people with lung cancer. So it wasn't such a good idea, and we had to back off from that. And so not every, every new development is, turns out to be a winner. And, and, and that takes us back to that sweat of your brow analogy, doesn't it? Um, the imagery that, that making progress... Making progress in this sin-cursed world is hard. It is frustrating. It is, a, it is an inch-by-inch inch fight. It's slow. Lots of failures. Lots of dead ends. And so some skepticism toward new developments in science. Some skepticism is warranted. Um, because it, don't, it doesn't turn out right the first time. Often, often we're in the spot of trying to of wave this this risk against that risk, or or this risk against this potential uh, t potential benefit, and and trying to trying to quantify things that are hard to quantify, and find a path of wisdom through it all. Well, on to the fifth principle, and we'll close with this. The fifth principle is that we look forward to the full redemption of ourselves and our world. There's a sense, like I just talked about, that, that humans are redeeming little bits of creation gradually over time as we, as we learn how to take dominion in different ways and do different things and combat different diseases and so on. But there's, there, we're, we're, we're offsetting some little bits of, of that fallenness 
And that's good. You know, we're joining God in that. We're, we're, we're in step with God's big agenda for the earth. But, but our efforts are, are far too small. Our, our efforts don't amount to very much compared to how badly sin has ruined things. The effect of sin goes way too deep, way too big. Uh, and so that means we desperately need help from the outside. We desperately need a Redeemer. And right here in Genesis chapter 3, if your Bible's still open there, right here in Genesis 3, when, God, when God's talking about all this bad news for Adam and Eve, right there He gives the promise of a coming Redeemer that's going to make it all right again in the end. So Genesis 3 verse 15, this is God talking to Satan and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior who's coming, the, the long expected Jesus the one who would be born of a woman, who would be from the seed of the woman. And he would bruise, Satan said. He would crush the head of the serpent. It says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. And he came to save his people from their sins. He came to undo all the bad results of all of our evilness. He came to put everything right. And He did it, how? By being, by being bruised Himself at the cross. It was His own suffering through which that, that redemption was accomplished. That's the Gospel. And you see, this, you see hints of this in Jesus' earthly ministry, don't you? He, he, come, he, begins, he begins to minister and He preaches, but He doesn't just preach, does He? He also does lots of what? Healing. He goes around healing all these diseases. What's he showing by that? He's showing this, this, that he's, he's not just redeeming on the spiritual side, but he's redeeming on the physical side too. He has the power to make the physical side better. And, and I think too, his, his, his feeding miracles probably all tie back to Genesis 3, you know, where Jesus feeds the 5,000 and then the 7,000 people just effortlessly. He's showing, look, I, I, I can do things that, that the thorns and thistles won't slow down. You know, I can, I can give food. I can give healing. So he's giving us, he's giving us hints of this in his ministry. Uh, but then the redemptive work culminates when he dies on the cross and rises from the dead, rises with eternal life, rises with a perfect glorified body now to live forever. Jesus Christ at the cross, He paid the total price for our sins. He paid the full debt to secure a full restoration of His people spiritually and physically and the creation as well. It's all included in Christ's redemptive work. It's not just the spiritual blessings that we normally talk about most of the time. Forgiveness of sins, having a renewed heart, having a personal relationship with God. Not just that, but also the physical side is included. Um, think of, think of uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Probably the greatest Old Testament chapter on Christ's atonement. What Christ's death accomplished uh, for us. And there's a verse in there about healing, isn't there? Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging, we are healed. Healed. Now, we enjoy some physical healings now. We've seen God do some healings in response to prayer. We rejoice in that. But mainly, we look forward to the future healing, the total healing that will be accomplished at the end of the world when Jesus comes back. 
The time that Peter calls, this is in Acts 3, verse 21, when Peter's preaching, he calls it the restoration of all things. That's how he viewed the end of the world. The restoration of all things. It's all going to be restored. It's all going to be fixed again. It's all going to be made perfect. That's when our bodies will be resurrected from the grave. Resurrected like Jesus' body. Glorious, perfect, perfect. Ready to live forever without hunger, without illness, without any of these problems that afflict us. And at that same time, like we read in Romans 8, the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Creation will be set free. Creation will be redeemed. Uh, you can read about it in 2 Peter chapter 3. He talks about a fire that's, that's burning everything up. And, at the same, and, then, and then later on in that chapter, he says we're looking for a new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. God's going to remake, going to remake the earth. Going to remake the heavens. Going to remake the universe. And it'll be perfect again. All these millions of Christians from all time will be resurrected with glorified bodies. Physical bodies, right? And what are they going to do? What are they going to do for the rest of eternity? Well, Jesus said they'll inherit the earth. They'll inherit the earth. They'll get this renewed earth. We'll live here on an earth that I think will be very much like this earth. Or the way this earth was before the fall. We'll be here. It'll be restored to its very goodness. It'll be restored like Eden. Now I cannot totally prove this last part from the Bible. But the way I imagine this working out. Is it's like we're going to be put back in the position Adam and Eve were in before the fall. In terms of our relation to the earth. And God again is going to give us the mandate. Take dominion. Rule here. Uh, display my image on earth. And we're going to get a chance to do it right. This time. We're going to get a chance to develop the earth. Without the thorns and thistles. And all the problems. And, and so I, I, think, I think the new earth. Will be a place of science and technology. A place of, of continual innovation. A place with where, where, where saints with those particular abilities will be able to flourish and thrive in those ways. That, that believers with an engineering bent will be able to do engineering stuff uh, on this earth and developing it and making it better for everybody. Um, I, I think that was God's original purpose. I think it will be restored. And it will be... Fantastic. The restoration of all things that's coming. And, and so, the, so the obvious question to make this personal to us sitting here is, are you going to be there? Are you going to be there in the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells? There's only one way to get to the new earth, which we, which we call heaven. Only one way to get there, and that's through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, being a follower of the Lord Jesus. Get in on His redemption by being one of His people. Trusting Him to save you from your sins and take you to heaven and give you eternal life. Trusting that His death and resurrection secures salvation for you. Jesus delights to save humbled sinners who come to Him for mercy. You can go to the Lord Jesus. You can be saved from your sins. You can be sure you're going to heaven. Lots of people, you ask them, well, are you going to heaven? And they kind of say, well, I, I kind of hope so. Or, or they say, oh, well, I hope so because I'm a good person. And then you tell them, well, then you're not <laughs> because you're addressing the wrong thing. But you can know for sure that you're going to heaven when you put your trust in the Lord Jesus, when you become a Christian. And so on that gospel note, we'll close the message. As I said at the beginning, my goal here is not to tell you what to think about all the specific questions. 
about vaccines or electronic gadgets or environmental stewardship or, or pursuing a career in science or medicine or something. But what I have to, tried to do is set forth a simple biblical structure whereby we can think in a reasonable, logical, Bible-centered way about these questions and and that's been really helpful for me I feel like I feel like this enabled me to go from just kind of having a hodgepodge of opinions about this stuff to having sort of a logical way to reason through the way I think about the natural world and and humans interaction with that world and and just try to to process these things and so and so I've, I've talked about it today in the hopes that it'd be helpful for you as you try to think about these these subjects and 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 work through you know your own your own convictions on all these these different questions so may god may god help us to think think biblically about stuff that's what we're aiming at isn't it amen